Welcome to Paper Defiance, a fortnightly podcast all about indie bookshops and their owners. My name's Alex, and I'm recording this on Wadawurrung land in Ballarat, Australia. It's exciting to have you join me for this first episode. So for this very first episode of Paper Defiance, I talked to Leah Koch of The Ripped Bodice, a bookshop in LA that focuses on romance books. About seven years ago, Leah and her sister raised more than $91,000 US on Kickstarter in order to get their bookshop off the ground. In this interview, Leah talks about why they wanted to start the store, what she loves about the physical space of the store, and, of course, the effects of COVID. At one point, Leah notes that a podcast isn't a visual medium, but if you go to paperdefiance.com, you'll see some pictures of their store. And of course, I've got links to their Instagram page and so on on my site. Two things before we get into the interview. First, make sure you don't just end the podcast after the interview, because there's a little something after it too. And second, there are a couple of swears in the interview, so if that's not right for your ears at the moment, maybe skip this episode. All right, over to Leah. Hello, my name is Leah Koch. My pronouns are she, her. I live in Los Angeles, California, and I'm one of the two owners of the Ripped Bodice Bookstore, which is a romance-focused independent bookstore. That leaves me with so many questions to ask. Uh, Firstly, the name is just so evocative. How did that come about? So the other owner of the store is my sister, B. And before we opened the store, she was getting her master's at New York University in fashion history. And she wrote her thesis on the clothing in historical romance novels. And it was called the the thesis Mending the Ripped Bodice. So in like the mainly 80s, bodice rippers was a term for romance novels generally considered to be a derogatory term because they were almost all historical and sometimes they literally featured the dude ripping the lady's bodice open so she named her thesis thought mending rip bodice and then we were like we like it you know I think we liked the idea of a couple of things one was like you know reclaiming what was previously a derogatory term because sort of the whole point of the store is you know respect for the romance genre and celebration of the romance genre but we also liked that it was like a little tongue-in-cheek and you know we wanted to signify that we take the book seriously but we don't take ourselves too seriously Uh, so an MA in fashion history how does that then turn into sorry for your sister How does that then turn into the both of you opening a bookshop? Well, we both have degrees in things that are traditionally considered not very useful. So she's two years older than me. She she was working on her master's while I was getting my undergraduate in visual and performing arts studies. And I think we both had discarded several career options and thoughts um, that we thought we were going to do. And, you know, both liked the idea of working for ourselves, working together. And so the way we came up with the idea from for the store was, well, number one, it'd be cool to own a store because then our lives will be like Gilmore Girls and we're like little shopkeepers, which is sometimes true and often not true. But we were like, okay, we open a shop. What does the shop sell? Well, the shop sells things that we like. <laughs> So we like books. So the shop should sell books. Well, the books that we like are romance novels. So the shop should sell romance novels. What if the shop only sold romance novels? And that was like the lightning bolt, light bulb, whatever moment. We were driving. uh, I was dropping her off at LAX. We were literally circling the airport. And we were like, huh, that's a good idea. And then she got on a plane back to New York. Four hours went by and she called me and she was like, that's a really good idea. I think we should do this. And it was very much full steam ahead from there. Like we really, you know, we were both at the end of educational um, things. So it was either get a job or figure something else out. And so we decided, you know, we really want to make a go of this. So we worked on our business plan. We 
thought about funding options and decided on Kickstarter. And we did the Kickstarter like about six months after that initial conversation. And then we opened the store five months after the Kickstarter. That that sounds really fast. Was that was that fast? Yeah, it was fast. It was fast. It was, I think that was partly dictated. It was dictated by two things. It was dictated by the, like I said, the end of those educational things. So, you know, it was either like do this really fast or get a job, do this in your free time. And maybe it never actually happens. Like, you know, we just felt like, you know, getting day jobs or whatever was just really, you know, going to slow us down. Like, cause we didn't, you know, it was only, I, I graduated from college in the middle of the year in December. And so we, we opened in March. And so that was one factor. And then the other factor was the Kickstarter aspect, because we were super familiar with Kickstarters, like lots of friends had used it for things. And there is this reputation sometimes that like, whatever project you're giving money to like you know comes to fruition like five years later like it just like can be really slow and so I think we felt like we're asking for a large sum of money we need to show these people that we are very serious that this is going to happen and and that you know we're we're moving and that their money is is being used so you know, once, once it became clear that we were going to meet our Kickstarter goal, we were, you know, looking for retail spaces because we were, we, yeah, we were just like, you know, we're, we're taking these people's money. We need to use it efficiently and speedily and let's, let's do it. So if you had a, if your Kickstarter obviously worked, you reached your funding goal, that says that a lot of people out there somewhere we're really keen on the idea of a romance focused uh, shop that's run by two women. Did you get uh, uh, equally positive reactions from like other people who like in the industry or your family? Yeah. I mean, it was kind of very, yeah. So at the time, uh, this is 2015. Uh, there was no romance bookstore in the United States. Wow. Um, really? So Yeah. Okay. That's, that seems remarkable to me. But. Yeah. I mean, and that, that's, I mean, I think some people would take that as a sign that they shouldn't do this. Like we took it as a sign that like, we're gonna do it. Um, because of that, there's no real way to do market research. Um, so the Kickstarter was essentially the market research. Cause it's basically like either people are excited and they give us money and we succeed or they don't and we fail. And we're like, okay, well maybe no one wants this. So that, you know, it was basically designed to be our market research. Our dad was, he would definitely disagree with this, but he's not on this podcast. So he definitely did not think we were going to raise that amount of money. <laughs> um, I think he was supportive. He was just like, he, it, that's also related to Kickstarter because he was like, what, strangers are going to give you money? And we were like, yeah. He's like, why? And we were like, well, they get a cool t-shirt and they like want to support us. Like he, he was very hung up on the whole Kickstarter aspect of it, but he would tell you now that of course he knew we were going to be a success. I would say reaction from romance people was generally positive. There was a lot of people, unlike you, really didn't like the name of the store and there was like this concerted effort to get us to change it and people were very mean about it and we were like I mean it was fine at the time it was like very traumatizing because we were so young and we were like oh my god they hate us now we're like why on earth would you care what somebody else names their bookstore but they did they really cared so there were definitely some of those but uh, that was mainly like old women but generally very positive and, you know, I think the the remarkable thing is that, like, a lot of our Kickstarter backers don't live in Los Angeles. Like, they they were not, they didn't know when, if ever, they might get to the store. It was really about having that home for romance readers that, you know, obviously was going to be digital as well. But that was, like, the really remarkable thing. We had, like, international, you know, dip backers. Like, that was the really remarkable thing to me. Uh, so if there's no other 
romance focused bookshop in the states how like did publishers were they fine with the idea of sending you books you know did publishers take you seriously in terms of getting your stock together uh well just to clarify there is now there's another romance bookstore now outside of Chicago, which is actually our hometown called Love Sweet Arrow. So now there's two. And I've met a woman who's planning to open one in San Diego. I, she's not done yet. But anyway. God, I don't even, I'm like trying to remember. I think they were, yeah, I think they were excited. I mean, you know, I, I do actually think this has changed a lot in the last six and a half years, but almost seven, but like, you know, romance just doesn't get very much respect in the publishing world. So I think, and and often in independent bookstores. So I think editors were like generally excited that, you know, something we would, we were <laughs> caring about it and, you know, showcasing their books. So um, yeah, I, I think generally positive. So one of the, the reasons that I'm doing this podcast is I'm fascinated by the spaces themselves of bookshops. Mm -hmm. I just, I love walking into a bookshop. I love seeing how they're set up and those sorts of things. So were there specific things that you thought about in terms of the space when you were thinking about what it was going to be like? Yeah, a ton. Um, we care about that a lot, um, mainly me due to the whole visual art degree. So when we were thinking about doing this, I mean, we're, we're big bookstore people. Like that's a big thing when we travel and in our hometown. And, you know, when we were thinking about doing this, we went, we took ourselves on a little bookstore tour of Los Angeles. There were some really fantastic ones. And, you know, one of the things we noticed like design wise is they, they often, not always, but often there's just something that feels very masculine about them. Oh, interesting. Now, Let's get one thing straight. Gender is made up. Yeah. Like <laughs> inanimate objects cannot be feminine or masculine, obviously. But like lots of heavy wood, you know, big shelves, dark often. So we really, we really wanted something that felt very feminine. I know I just said that doesn't mean anything. And also that, that just was very bright and happy and felt very like celebratory and fun again like you know not take ourselves too seriously so when we walked into our space for the first time the first thing we noticed is it has two huge skylights and we were like wow it's so light in here like it's just it feels it has really tall ceilings like it feels really big and open and airy and it was actually bigger than we had planned on but the price was right. So, so that was like the, the first thing from the sort of bare bones. And then I think our attitude is if it can be bought antique, it should be bought antique. All, almost all the shelves and tables are antiques. We don't really like like fixture what's called like fixtures like that you would buy from like a catalog or a website or something now there are some downsides to this i was literally just talking to my bookseller earlier like they're a little bit harder to clean like we went to the pasadena flea market here in los angeles and a couple of great antique stores for a lot of our fixtures because we just like that look better it's more interesting it has more character we have a, like a table that's made out of like an old singer sewing machine that like people are always pointing out and yeah, so just like a no, nothing corporate, nothing homogenous, like, you know, just as much like one of the first Yelp reviews we got was like, it's decorated like your grandmother's attic. And she clearly meant that to be an insult. And we were like, yeah, <laughs> like that is the point. Yeah, that is somewhere um, I want to visit. That sounds great. Yeah. We we're like, that's not an insult. Like, and then just, you know, a, a lot of, as much creativity and personality as we can jam into the space. So if you're listening to this, you should go look at some pictures. I know this is not a visual medium, but I, and I also use books to decorate whenever possible. So there's books hanging from the ceiling. There's books attached to the wall. There's like a rainbow made out of books. And number one, that's because it's free material because we have more used books than we'll ever be able to sell. And 
number two because it's cool (laughs) and number three and this is something we were considering from the beginning the store is meant to be photographed and instagrammed and shared with your friends like that's on purpose because that's part of marketing in the 21st century so we want to create this beautiful space that people want to take pictures of and then show their friends Yeah, I mean, I feel like I could keep going forever, but a a lot of different, you know, design things and I enjoy, I'm, I'm up in our attic right now, which is where I store all of my seasonal decorations. So there's like a life-size skeleton and there's an entire wall of Christmas decorations. Like I really enjoy decorating seasonally and, you know, having fun seasonal displays. It's, it's something I really enjoy and it's still you're we're talking on a auspicious day it's not done I I, yes the the window display last month for pride here in the United States was this giant um LGBTQ progress pride flag made out of used book covers turned out really cool you can see pictures on our Instagram and I knew as I was making it like you know it took a long time I was like I'm not just gonna put this in the window and then never use it again like it's too cool So I was like, okay, we're going to put it. So I hung it up on a wall um, in the store, but that necessitated me moving some shelves and that necessitated moving other shelves. So I've literally been spending the day like moving different things around. The shelves we had to move were for kids books. And then the open spot was next to the erotica section. And I was like... (laughs) Uh, this is maybe not the best idea. So we have to put something else there. Again, it's been a while since I've done this. I used to move the furniture around all the time. And sometimes customers will be like, when are you going to stop moving things? And my response sounds slightly nutty or slash obsessive. Cause I'm like, when it's perfect, I'll stop moving things when it's perfect. It's not perfect yet. Like, and it honestly will likely never be perfect, but you know, it's like, <laughs> One day, maybe, I will have run out of things to do. Again, it seems unlikely. But you can see pictures of the flag on our Instagram. It did come out very cool. Uh, So this might be a hard question then, but do you have a favorite part of the shop itself? I mean, God, I don't even know. Like, it's usually... It's honestly probably the window display, which is, again, always changing. So that's, and that's where I like, again, because I try not to change everything all the time. Like, that's where I'm like putting a lot of my creative energy. So yeah, I would probably say the window. Um, Second choice, and this is what a lot of customers say, and it's really weird. It's the bathroom. There are also pictures of that on our Instagram. And people often share that because six and a half years ago we started we we put up a sign that said like leave a post-it note of whatever you want and we put a bunch of post-its in the bathroom and pens and now six and a half years later god I've never even estimated I mean there's got to be over 500 maybe even more the place is just plastered in post-its of you know, lots of, you know, empowerment, like you go girl kind of thing. I love when people draw stuff, you know, people do like a little sketch or a little drawing. They'll put, you know, like what you would, you know, carve in your desk in middle school, you know, Tracy Hart's John or something like that. People will write like where they're visiting from, um, you know, if they're, especially if they're from like another country, it's really cool. And it's just, it's really I mean, and it's also quite the time capsule you can see. I mean, we don't really take them down. So people just put them over them. But, you know, like around our last disastrous election here in the United States, there was like an explosion of, you know, this is bad, but everything's going to be okay kind of thing. It's, yeah, it's actually a really cool, I, I don't, it was certainly not, we didn't anticipate it becoming this cool um we're like it's the bathroom but uh it is very cool that is awesome which leads me into again another question i wanted to ask what do you think's been one of the most surprising things that you have learned or experienced over the last seven or so years um i think the degree to which 
we were going to feel like a part of people's lives. I'm going to a customer's wedding on Saturday. Oh, wow. Like literally. <laughs> um, she invited our whole staff. <laughs> it's so lovely and they're coming earlier in the day because she wants to take pictures in the store in her wedding outfit and that it's I just I never would have thought of that like it's and then there's another I mean this is sort of related there are other things but like another regular regular customer like got engaged to the man that I remember when she went on her first date with him like she told me, she was like, I was like, what are you doing this weekend? And she was like, oh, I have this like kind of promising date with this guy. Like, and now they're getting married. Like there is a child who was in utero when we opened, who is like starting first grade, <laughs> you know, we, we see kids in the neighborhood grow up and people get pets and I don't know. It's just, I, it's, it's really amazing. And it's so it's just really cool when people we get to see people's lives and and you're just this like sort of you know fly on the wall like and it's just through you know conversations that we have with people that you know they have with their friends as they're shopping and a lot of people make have made friends through the store which has been really fun to see so yeah I I think it's just I never would have expected that I would be attending a customer's wedding. I I never would have expected that. Uh, which then in turn also leads me to kind of one, I think one of the big questions that I've been thinking about over the last few years is what, what do you think the point of a physical bookshop is when, mm -hmm. you know, you and I could easily buy a book, even a, a paper book via one of the big online uh places if we wanted to so why is it that so many people from around the world wanted to give you money to start a new bookshop why do they why do we keep going to the physical places do you think I th I I would have loved to have interviewed myself two and a half years ago and answered that question because I think nothing made it more clear than COVID so obviously our experience has been a bit different than yours um in the united states we had to we were required to close the shop for about three months and then we were able to reopen but it was at very limited capacity and we couldn't do any like events or stuff for about two years so so it's a couple things number one for for like your actual shopping experience i think that there's two things that a physical shop can provide that the internet does not provide. Listen, I love the internet, but <laughs> uh, number one is the ability to browse. It's just, it's a lot hard. You can do it on the internet, but it's a lot harder. Like, you know, you have to know what you're looking for. So, and it, you, you know, you might get taken other places, but like just that ability, there's just so much less of a chance that you're going to find something that you were not at all looking for because you wandered into that section or you know it, you just picked it up because it looked interesting there's just so much less of that on the internet and then the second part of that is you know our booksellers and the hand selling experience and the ability to talk to a real life person aka a human algorithm <laughs> um, that's what algorithms try to do but you come in and you say I liked this this and this I didn't like this and we say, okay, try X, X, and X. We, we have something computers do not have. <laughs> and, you know, that was really, I think, the experience I was trying to recreate for people when the store was closed to um, foot traffic. We, we set up this, like, form where people could say, you know, I liked this, I didn't like this, and I want three books. Like, can you choose them for me? And we, we were choosing books for people via the internet and we still do it around the holiday it, it was so popular they people really wanted us to do it all year it's not really possible to do all year because it's so much work <laughs> we still do it around the holidays and we'll, we'll you know we'll build you a custom care package you know you can say I want one historical that's sort of similar to this and I also want a candle and I want you know et cetera et cetera 
So that's like, you know, the, the, the actual shopping aspect. And, and then, you know, the, the other thing is, you know, like I said, we, once we reopened to foot traffic, we still couldn't do events. And it was just, people were just like begging, like, (laughs) when can we come to book club? When can we do writing classes? Like, when are you going to have authors again? And that is, you know, and, and again, we also had a pandemic version. Like we did some, a lot of virtual stuff, and some of it was great and and we're still doing some because there is, you know, a nice aspect. There's there's certainly an accessibility aspect to that. You know, you could attend an event from Australia. Yeah. That's very nice. But it's just not the same human interaction. You know, there's a big difference between listening to an author talk via Zoom alone in your house and coming to the store chatting with people beforehand shopping like maybe meeting up with friends or or just talking to the people next to you then listening to the author then standing in a signing line like god more friends have been made in signing lines at this (laughs) store like you know people just like hang out with the people in front of and behind them and you know i i always you know people romance readers are very uh like sharing and they're very nosy so they'll, you know they see why they see what books you're holding and they say oh I loved that one and and they just don't have that virtually so it is and it is that community aspect we did try to do our book club virtually and it you know just wasn't successful I think people were really like they had there was so much virtual stuff going yeah. on so I, I just think that community aspect and I, I would wager that many people who you ask this question will say some version of the word community it's just and I think it is fairly unique to bookstores I mean you know there's you know something like uh whether you have a community center in your town or like a boys and girls club or something but you know this is very focused on one thing it's you know it's like uh I don't know I'm like trying to think I guess it's like a store that only sells I mean it is a store that only sells one thing but I'm trying to compare I suspect somewhere like a like a yarn shop or a quilting shop yeah. might yeah, have a similar sure. sort of thing also which is also quite a feminine space right funnily enough I'm an avid quilter yeah but there there aren't that many things that are comparable where it's like this community for adults that are focused on one particular thing that is in person like obviously you can find a lot of those online Mm. and we do a lot of stuff online as well but yeah I, I just think bookstores hold such a special place in society and just cannot be replicated on the internet you can get close and you can do a lot of stuff and I am not a fan of you know people who like people who shit on ebooks because there are some serious accessibility issues um and class issues with that it's like if you're shitting on ebooks you're kind of shitting on people with disabilities and poor people which is not a great thing I'm a fan of more people reading however they need to do that I just don't think that anything to do with ebooks is at the exclusion of paper books. Like, I think it's been long proved that ebooks, audiobooks, paper books can all coincide, coexist very peacefully together, and everybody can be happy. And there's no real reason, you know, I, every once in a while on the internet, someone's like, this is the only real way to read. And I was like, why? (laughs) Leah, I have two final questions for you. Number one, what are you currently reading? I'm currently reading. I I almost am always reading advanced copies of things because I'm a fancy person. So I'm currently reading an advanced copy of a book. I can't remember when it's coming out sometime in the fall called When in Rome by Sarah Adams. It's an upcoming rom-com contemporary romance that takes place in Rome, Kentucky. And it's very charming so far. I'm really enjoying it. It's about like a a pop star who's sort of overwhelmed with her life and her favorite movie is Roman Holiday. <laughs> and so she's like, I'm going to go to Rome, Kentucky and hide and, and try to have a break. And the, and she, she her car breaks down uh, in front of the local pie shop owner's house. He takes her in somewhat begrudgingly. Uh, it's really, it's really charming so far. I'm really enjoying it. 
And, you know, honestly, I'm almost always reading about three books at the same time, but that is my my one and only at the moment. (laughs) Um, Very restrained of you. Yeah. It's real. It's shocking. I I'm really bad actually at only reading one book at the same time. I try, but uh, that at the moment that one uh, is 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 holding my attention completely. Uh, and finally, uh, is there anything you would like the listeners to know about? Anything you would like to promote? Social media or events that are coming up in the next couple of months? Yes. Well, the first thing is we were talking before we turned their recording on and you were saying that a, a friend, you know, likes the store without ever having been here. <laughs> um, and that is very common. And we would love to, you know, welcome you to our community, even, no matter where you live. We have many, many, many people who I think would say, I love the Ripatis. I've never been there. So you can absolutely shop on our website, which is, the ripped bodice.com. We're pretty much the ripped bodice everywhere. If you search that on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, you will find us. We are, I guess at this point, we're not new to TikTok anymore. I think it's been like a year, but if you want to see us at our silliest, <laughs> um, that is where you should go. And we're like old for TikTok. So uh, it's generally me trying to figure out, like, I, I won't dance, but I'm like, how, what? are these weird trends that I need to be doing and we ship all over the world. It is often not very economical, but we do have a lot of authors coming through these days and we, and we almost always offer signed books on the internet. So, you know, if you can kind of get a bunch of stuff at once, it can be worth your while. And if you are ever in Los Angeles, uh, we would love to see you. Uh, our neighborhood is called Culver City. It's sort of central Los Angeles. And please, please come visit. We, you know, we get people from all over the world. We get a fair number of people from Australia. There's a big romance loving community in Australia. There really is. You would sadly not be the first Australian. And I've actually never been to Australia. So uh, maybe someday I will uh, make it over there. I have been to New Zealand, but not to Australia. But whether it's virtual or in person, we'd still like to be friends with you. <laughs> well, Leah, thank you very much for talking to me. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. My thanks again to Leah at The Ripped Bodice for her time. As promised, this isn't actually the end of the podcast. Each episode, I'm going to feature a vignette from someone talking about one of their favourite bookshops. To start us off, this is Amy. Hi, I'm Amy. And one of my favorite bookshops is called The Book Tree. It would be enough to know that it has a constant stock of Terry Pratchett novels. It would be enough to know that the owner always knows when the next Louise Penny book is coming out. It would be enough to know that the owner is a T.S. Eliot aficionado, has an absolutely stellar children's book collection, and hosts local authors routinely. There are an awful lot of it would be enough to know about this particular bookshop. But my absolute favorite memory came on the day I found Lady of the Forest by Jennifer Roberson. And at the counter, when paying for it, was read a fantastic poem by the owner containing the phrase, Fuck you, T.S. Eliot. Pepper Defiance is created and produced by me, Alex. The music is called Loopster, and it's by Kevin McLeod. You can find the attribution at paperdefiance.com.